CIS representatives from permanent missions and international organizations, partners, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants. Uh, very warm welcome to this uh, FAO Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks. My name is Dominique Bourgeon and I'm the director of the FAO Liaison Office in Geneva and I'm very pleased to moderate this event today. Uh, this is actually the third Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks event of 2022. And I wish to highlight that this series is co-organized with the FAO headquarters uh, market and trade division. Uh, of course, we are extremely grateful to them. Our objective is to share information on important and timely topics that are at the intersection of trade and agriculture. We have a series of events uh, planned throughout the year. Uh, they will take place essentially on a monthly basis. I would like to thank you for taking the time to attend our meeting today. Of course, given this uh, very busy uh, time in the Geneva agenda, we greatly appreciate your support and interest in FAO's work. Before starting our event, allow me, even if you are not all professional in the matter, allow me to share some details regarding the logistics and housekeeping for this virtual session. You are invited to update your name and organization by clicking on the dots that appear in the right hand corner of the box where your own personal video stream appears and select rename. This webinar will be in English only with no interpretation. It will be recorded and will be later available on our website, along with the various related resources relevant to this session and all registered participants will be uh, receiving all this. Uh, this event is scheduled to last for about 90 minutes. We have reserved some time towards the end of the webinar for comments and intervention. If you wish to intervene, please use the uh, Q&A uh, module, not the chat box. Kindly state your name and organization or institution. We'll try to accommodate as many requests as possible. So that's all for our housekeeping issue. And I would like now to take a moment to present FAO's work uh, today's topic and our speakers. As you know, FAO supports members' efforts to formulate trade policies that are conducive to improved food security by strengthening evidence and analysis, providing capacity development and facilitating a neutral dialogue away from the negotiating table. In this spirit, the FAO Geneva Agricultural Trade Talks are based on approach we call the three highs. Informal, exchanging information, ideas, and views without any attribution. Interactive, providing a neutral platform for dialogue and engagement among stakeholders. And inspirational, sharing knowledge and ideas for use in policy and negotiations accordingly. The global rules-based trading system provides a level playing field through its principles of non-discrimination, especially as expressed through the most favored nation and national treatment rules. As the WTO membership covers almost the whole world, global trade should offer equal opportunities for trade crisscrossing the, the globe. However, when studying trade paths in more detail, it becomes apparent that there is a disparity between the amount of trade within and among different geographical groupings. Consequently, there should be an opportunity to be seized to increase trade, especially in the global south. Increased trade can indeed, and if managed in an equitable and sustainable way, contribute to poverty reduction and sustainability. Today, a couple of hours ago, FAO has launched a new report entitled Agricultural Trade in the Global South, an overview of trends in performance, vulnerabilities, and policy framework. We are very lucky to have the authors of this report with us to, here today, and they will explain the findings in more details. For that, I'm very pleased to introduce Ms. Ishrat Gadok and, Ms., and Mr. Sorry, uh, Cosimo Avesan. Uh, Ms. Ishrat Gadok is an economist in the market and trade division of FAO. Her expertise lies in global value chains, trade policy, trade agreements, trade and food security, sustainability standards. Prior to joining FAO, Ms. Gadok uh, 
worked as a management consultant with KPMG and an economist with the Canadian Minister of Agriculture. Ishrat holds a master, a master in food and resource economics and a bachelor in science, both from the University of British Columbia in Canada. She's currently pursuing studies in management at the Said Business School, University of Oxford. Mr. Cosimo Avesani is a trade policy expert in the market and trade division of FAO. His expertise lies in trade policy, trade agreements, trade and food security, multilateral trade negotiations. Before joining FAO, he served as policy director at the Brussels office of the Transatlantic Business Council and as the chief of staff and policy advisor in the cabinet of the Italian deputy minister for foreign trade. Mr. Avesani holds a BA in international relations from the University of Bologna and an MA in international politics and diplomacy from the University of Padua. Following these presentations, uh, His Excellency Mr. Jose Luis Cancela Gomez, the permanent representative of, of Uruguay to the WTO, and Mr. Rashid Kokab from Cuts in Geneva will share with us some of their views on these topics. We we'll know hear from Ishrat about her overview of this issue. As mentioned earlier, please post any questions in the Q&A module. We will pass on your question to the presenter following their presentation. Ishrat, after this long introduction, I'm very pleased to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, I hope you can now see my presentation. Yes, very well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much again for the, the introduction, Dominique, and good afternoon to all the participants. It's my great pleasure to be here um, and present the findings of our new report, together with my colleague Cosimo. Um, several others have contributed to the report as well, and we are happy to have the opportunity to present the findings and, and discuss with the, have a discussion with you all today. So let me get right into uh, the contents. Um, and this is uh, structured, the presentation today is structured um, very similar to how the, the actual report is structured. Uh, and I'll start by providing a, a very brief overview of the scope and objectives of the study. Uh, I'll then discuss uh, the, the first part of this presentation, which is uh, providing an overview of agricultural trade patterns in South countries um, and discuss the agricultural trade dependence that these countries have on specific products and trading partners. Uh, after this, I'll hand over to um, Cosimo, to, who will present uh, the remaining three sections focusing on South countries and the multilateral trading system, um, their participation in regional trade agreements, um, and he'll also offer some conclusions and policy priorities. So let me start by mentioning that in this uh, study, we refer to Global South or South countries interchangeably. And this grouping essentially encompasses 150 countries, states, and territories. Um, what we found was that in, uh, in other technical reports, um, there's no uh, universal definition of South or Global South or North. It really depends on the purpose um, uh, for which um, that study is being done. So sometimes it's defined purely by income classification, sometimes by political groups. Uh, but because in our case, we were interested in regional um, trade patterns, we adopted um, a regional classification for the purposes of our study. Um, this is the UNDP classification of developing regions, and this includes six regions. So all the countries that are within these regions are considered south, whereas others are considered north, again, only for the purposes of this study. Um, uh, in terms of agricultural products, uh, this, referred, uh, this report refers to all those that are covered by the WTO Agreement on Agriculture. Now, in terms of the objectives of this report, um, the starting point for us was really a request uh, by our colleagues in FAO South-South and Triangular Cooperation Unit. Um, and the idea was uh, to have a sort of a baseline report, a snapshot, if you will, um, to inform their discussions uh, with stakeholders um, on, on issues of South-South trade and investment. Um, so really, it provides a snapshot, a baseline sort of overview of trade trends, of vulnerabilities, um, and of the policy frameworks that underlie agricultural trade in South countries. Uh, and we hope that this can serve uh, more as a starting point or, or the basis for more in-depth analysis and also eventually uh, programming and project design. So let me get right into the, the meat of this, uh, of this paper. So let me start with an overview of agricultural trade patterns. 
Um, so North countries, uh, it's important to recognize that North countries actually account for greater levels of both exports and imports of agricultural products than South countries. So on average in 2016-18, um, the agricultural exports of North countries totaled about 744 billion, the imports around 736 billion, um, which is 1.6 times the agricultural exports and imports of South countries. So it is higher. Um, that being said, there has been a steady expansion in the participation of South countries in agricultural trade over the last two decades. So whereas in 2000, 2002, um, South countries accounted for about 30% of total global agricultural exports um, and about 27% of imports, that share has now increased to about 38% for both. And this increasing participation of South countries in agricultural trade is generally consistent with um, their, the trend uh, in increasing um, participation also in, in merchandise trade more broadly. Um, one thing to note, though, is that um, South countries' agricultural imports have been growing faster than their exports. So their positive trade balance has been declining, especially after the 2007-2008 food price crisis. And there are several factors that underlie this trend. Of course, there's growing demand. Um, you have increasing uh, incomes, growing urbanization, population size, and so on. That's driving demand for increased um, diversity of products, while uh, at the same time, many countries in the Global South face supply-side constraints that limit their potential for domestic production to be uh, meeting this demand. Um, if we look at the product spe uh, specialization of South versus North countries, we see um, some important differences. So uh, let's look in first in terms of the export. Um, South countries as, um, as a whole, as a group, are net exporters of primary agricultural products, uh, uh, such as fruits and vegetable, um, many tropical products like coffee, tea, cocoa, and sugar, uh, as well as some processed products like vegetable oils. Um, and what's more is that uh, South countries make up a, a large share of these um, exports. So for instance, it's something like 68% of global exports of coffee, tea, and spices, 61% for sugar, 56% for fruits and nuts. These are all South countries uh, making up these shares. And if we dig even deeper, we find that it's actually a few countries that dominate um, exports of these products. So for instance, in coffee, Brazil and Vietnam are the big players. In fruits and vegetables, it's China, Chile, Mexico, oils, it's, it's uh, Indonesia and Malaysia and so on. On the import side, um, the key difference is that uh, countries in the global south are net importers of many food commodities, such as dairy products, cereals, meat, as well as vegetable, uh, some vegetable textile fibers, um, including cotton. And similar to exports, um, South countries account for significant shares uh, of the global imports of many of these products. So for instance, 65% of all cereals and oil seeds imports are destined for South countries, 30% for meat and dairy products. And again, at least for some commodities, um, you see uh, a, that these, are, these imports are dominated by a few countries. So China for oil seeds, meat, dairy, and fats, uh, and oils rather. Um, Arab countries particularly are important importers of cereals, particularly Egypt and Saudi Arabia, uh, and so on. Um, there are also significant differences among um, South country regions in terms of their trade balance. So Arab states are uh, significant net importers. And again, the, the regional groupings here are, are based on the UNDP classification, uh, just to bear that in mind. So um, Arab states are significant net importers, uh, followed by South Asia. And since 2010, uh, East Asia and the Pacific, which switched from being a net exporting region to a net importing region. By contrast, uh, we see that uh, Latin America and Caribbean has been a significant and growing um, net exporter. Uh, and also since 2011, Europe and Central Asia has been, um, the, the, the net exports have been growing. Um, and Sub-Saharan Africa sort of has been very volatile in terms of its um, net trade position. Uh, its, its trade balance has nevertheless declined significantly uh, since, uh, since two decades ago. Uh, but going back to these trends about overall increase in both exports and imports uh, of South countries, a key feature of that growth uh, has been uh, growing levels of South-South trade. So in this slide, I'm only presenting the export uh, side, not the import, um, just uh, in terms of saving time, and, and the story is somewhat similar. Uh, but here, for instance, on exports, South-South trade refers to the share of agricultural exports of South countries that are destined to other countries within the Global South. So this chart shows that while in 2000, 2002, 
Um, agricultural exports accounted for about 40% uh, of total, um, uh, of total uh, South exports. This share has now increased to about 56% today. And the second chart shows a, re a regional breakdown of that. So the chart on top is saying these are the total exports by region. So you have Latin America, Caribbean, East Asia, and the Pacific, and so on. These are the total exports. And below you have the share of those exports that are destined for different markets. So um, the, the share that's going to north is in gray, and uh, the one that's, that's going to other south regions is in these the combination of these pink. And further, you can break it down into whether it's intra-regional, so the light pink, or it's inter-regional. So it's going from, let's say, Latin America and Caribbean to other countries, um, such as East Asia and Pacific and others. So what we see in terms of exports is that um, South South, the growth in South South trade, first of all, it's, it's grown in every region. Uh, and this is driven uh, significantly by inter-regional trade. So the trade from Latin America and Caribbean, and particularly uh, Europe and Central Asia, and these are these are two net exporting regions, their, their shares um, of inter-regional South South trade have, have actually more than doubled uh, over the last two decades. Um, so there's really a story of um, increasingly the demand within South countries being met by, um, uh, by exports from other South countries. So what does all this mean in terms of their dependence on, um, on both exports and imports? And, and are there some vulnerabilities that, that we should be mindful of? So um, first of all, by dependence in this report, um, we're using a, a fairly simple measure. Uh, we use several measures, but one of the, the simplest ones is what's called concentration ratio three. Uh, and this can be calculated for both um, exports and imports. So as an example, um, and sorry, this can also be calculated for both um, partners or so trading partners and commodities. So I can explain this further. Um, in terms of concentration ratio three in partner, CR3 as it's called, for exports, this is measuring the share of the top three destinations in total agricultural export. So the share of how, how concentrated are your exports in, in three commodities. Um, so this captures, of course, the vulnerability to market shocks. Um, uh, sorry, this is this is commodity CRC. So it, it, it captures the vulnerability that, that these countries might face uh, relating to these commodities. And partner CR3 measures the share of the top three destinations in total agricultural exports. Um, what are the top three markets? What share uh, do they do they take up of total exports? Um, and so I'm going to present two uh, charts here. Um, one is for exports and one is for imports. And basically what it's showing is um, on average for each of the, the regions, uh, the South country regions, so these are all these different colors. Um, what we see is country dependency on the x-axis and commodity dependency on the y-axis. And what we're looking at here is um, first of all, a the extent to which that that region, or on average, the countries in that region are dependent on a small set of uh, a small set of um, partners, and the extent to which they're they're dependent on a small set of commodities. It also shows a relative dependency. So if you're above the 45 degree line, then these regions are relatively more dependent on a small set of commodities than they are on a small set of um, trading partners. And it shows the change over time. So what happened over the last 20 years uh, in terms of uh, both partner and commodity dependency? A horizontal shift um, towards the left shows that partner dependency went down. Um, and a vertical shift, upward shift, would mean that um, the commodity dependency went up. So in terms of exports, what do we see? Firstly, we see that in all of these South country regions, um, their commodity dependency and, um, and partner dependency tends to be higher than um, that for North countries. Secondly, we see that these regions are relatively more dependent on commodities than they are on trading partners. And that in most regions, while partner dependency has declined, there's a leftward movement. Um, there's uh, commodity dependency has gone up in exports. So there's an upward movement in, in, in the dependencies. In terms of imports, we see relatively more um, diversity. So we see, uh, for instance, some regions are relatively more dependent on specific trading partners like Latin America and the Caribbean, um, East uh, Europe and Central Asia. Um, whereas in other cases, uh, such as Arab states and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, there's growing a commodity dependency in imports. Uh, or slight growing uh, commodity dependency in imports. Uh, on average, the, here we see that uh, partner dependency tends to have declined in most regions. So there's more diversification going on in terms of 
trading partners in both exports and imports, whereas commodity dependency tends to go up, uh, particularly for exports to, and to a lesser extent for imports. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, these are very aggregate trends. They're simple averages, they're not trade weighted. So ideally, really they serve as a starting point for delving deeper um, and there is significant heterogeneity by country. So I just have two more slides. Uh, I know that's a lot to take in. So I just wanted to provide some examples, both in terms of uh, countries uh, on the export side and import side to try to make this a bit clearer. And of course, I'm happy to discuss this in, in the question and answers as well. So what this slide shows, uh, focusing on export dependency, is that um, many countries in the, uh, the Global South derive over 50% of their total merchandise export earnings from agricultural exports. So particularly um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, what this means is that uh, basically uh, over 50% of their foreign exchange earnings are, are uh, relying on agricultural uh, products. And the share has actually increased in many of these countries over the last two decades. Now, this dependency is exacerbated when we consider that, um, for instance, in Latin America and Caribbean, even in the largest exporting countries, um, the CR3, commodity CR3, is over 60%. So not only are they um, heavily reliant on agricultural exports for their foreign exchange uh, earnings, th these are concentrated in only three products in many cases. So this is, this is where um, the, the, the combination of these factors can, can increase dependency. Uh, but that being said, on the other hand, there's a general trend towards diversifying trading partners. So at least in terms of the partner, uh, the, the export markets, um, there's a, a relative trend towards um, increasing diversification. Uh, and again, this is my last slide on import dependency. This chart shows for Sub-Saharan Africa, both uh, commodity, commodity dependency in blue and partner dependency in gray. Uh, and we see that this is one region where um, compared to many others, commodity dependency is high and it's, it's actually increased in imports. This shows that um, in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, 17 of them, if I counted correctly, it's, uh, this dependency is over 60% and it's increased in 10 of these countries. And these imports tend to be mainly concentrated in food commodities. So for instance, uh, Benin, which saw a 30% increase uh, in commodity dependency, agricultural imports mainly comprise of rice, palm oil, and sugar. Uh, another example would be um, Zimbabwe, where again, it increased and it's mainly comprising of wheat, rice, and soybeans. So it's exacerbated, particularly when we consider that in these countries, partner dependency also increased. But again, keep in mind that on the whole, particularly in South Sub-Saharan Africa, but, but mostly in other regions, uh, partner dependency has declined. So there's increasing diversity in import sources, whereas on commodities, in some cases, it's, it's going up. So let me stop there, and I will then pass on. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Ishrat, and uh, very interesting even if, as you say, a lot to take and very dense, but, but very interesting. Uh, and I would like now, of course, to pass the floor to uh, Cosimo for his pre presentation. Over to you, Cosimo. Voila. I hope you can see it. Perfectly. Perfect. Okay. So we will now look a bit on uh, South countries and the multilateral trading uh, system. So let's see if my presentation works. Yes. So. One of the major achievements uh, we know about the Uruguay round, so the last uh, round of um, negotiations under the GATT, was the establishment of the WTO and, of course, the entry into force of the Agreement on Agriculture. So, to date, uh, uh, we know that the Agreement on Agriculture is the only legally binding multilateral treaty regulating agricultural trade. Some countries have been, we can say, at the heart of this uh, trade re revolution with uh, some 75 uh, South countries uh, that have been members of the organization since uh, 1995. And after the establishment of the WTO, uh, 45 additional South countries joined the organization. And today, um, only a few ones are not yet members, uh, even though most of them have commenced their accession process. Uh, so Algeria, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uzbekistan, and so on. But uh, what was the impact of the agreement on agriculture on agricultural trade, or better, what did it mean for, for South countries? So let's take a look first at the tariffs. So with the entry to force of the agreement on agriculture, we all know that members of the WTO committed to not restrict, restricting imports by any other means than tariffs and to keep their rates within set thresholds determined by for each country. 
these rates are known as uh, um, bound tariffs, but members are clearly allowed to increase or decrease their tariffs as long as they keep them within the, the bound levels. And these are known as uh, applied tariffs. So as we can see here in the slide, uh, the average bound tariffs are rather high in some countries. However, there's almost no difference between South and no countries in the applied tariffs. And we're always talking here about the aggregate level. Here we can make three uh, basic considerations. So first of all, that South countries are usually more open than their bound tariffs would suggest. And if we consider the aggregate value, we can see that uh, while, for instance, bound tariffs for the whole group is set at some uh, 57%, uh, the applied tariffs are applied at around uh, 14. And the same can be said as well for the regional groups or the, let's say, the special groups. So seeds, LDCs, uh, landlocked developing countries, and so on. In particular, we see that the difference for, um, for LDCs uh, is uh, is high, so it's set at around 60 percentage points. Um, second, this means that some countries have considerable watering tariff, which leads us to a third consideration, which is that some countries could potentially increase their tariffs while respecting WTO commitments. But let's give a look to the state of play in the WTO. So the role of the WTO in uh, ensuring stability, transparency, and openness in the multilateral trading system, I would say, has been widely recognized. Uh, this being said, uh, the, I would say, growing reluctance of some members to deepen trade talks in the context of the Doha round has somehow hindered the negotiating function of the, of the WTO. And this, I would say, was pretty evident uh, at the 11th uh, ministerial conference of the WTO, which was held in uh, Buenos Aires in 2017. With regard to South countries, however, we can say that they've been uh, actively participating in the Doha round of negotiation as their interest uh, in uh, setting global trading rules has been growing alongside with their participation in international trade as Ishad was showing us before. However, as it is normal, uh, there are conflicting positions among South countries. And these positions are well reflected in the WTO discussions where members have formed a, a number of negotiating coalitions based on their um, agricultural interests. So depending on whether they are uh, net food importers, net food exporters, uh, if they have an interest for special differentiated treatment, uh, and depending as well on the degree of uh, openness they are trying to achieve from WTO partners. Transparency. Well, with regard to transparency, it is, I would say, common knowledge that many members have not fulfilled their transparency obligations uh, to the WTO in a timely manner. And this can create problems, as a failure to fulfill the transparency obligation can make it hard to monitor compliance with the WTO and therefore seek reinforcement. And um, in this regard, it should be noted that uh, a large number of notifications remain pending from the period 1995 2019, as we can see here in the slide. And this was particularly the case for uh, domestic support uh, measures and dispute settlement. So uh, this is a central pillar of WTO. It provides uh, security, predictability to the multilateral trading system. Uh, it ensures the, um, the rights and obligations of members in the framework of the agreement on agriculture. And of course, it clarifies such rules and obligations through interpretation. Now, uh, according to a study by Joe Glauber and Zing that was released in uh, 2020, out of almost uh, 600 disputes, uh, 593, that were fi filed between 1995 and 2019, 14% uh, of full cases cited the agreement on agriculture in the request for consultation. And here on the right side of the slide, we can see a trend. So in the first five years following the implementation of the agreement, cases were more frequent, but the frequency of filing has declined since then, following a kind of um, similar path for pro cases. And some countries have been largely using this mechanism, either as compliance or respondents. And they've been responsible for some 50% of the cases and complaints for around 30, showing definitely the centrality of this instrument for South countries. 
Now, on the participation in regional trade agreements, uh, um, so along with the multilateral uh, agreement negotiations, uh, um, WTO members have been um, increasingly participating in RTAs. Uh, but what RTAs are RTAs in the first place? So they are trade agreements of mutually preferential nature and include bilateral, regional, or inter-regional trade agreements, customs unions, economic unions, and common markets. Since the establishment of the WTO, the number of RTAs notified to the WTO has grown enormously, from about 50 to more than 350 that are currently in, uh, in force. But why countries are choosing RTAs? Well, one of the key reasons is that by reducing the number of participating countries, RTAs can help achieve consensus on common priorities, uh, promote greater levels of integration, and of course, lead to trade creation. Overall, we, we also see that the treatment of agriculture in RTAs follow a sort of WTO plus path, meaning that what is agreed among RTAs partners and normally to go beyond what has been agreed at the multilateral level. For instance, partners in many RTAs took important steps to fully liberalize agricultural tariffs. And in the RTA context, South countries are extremely active and they are taking further steps as well in the creation of the so-called uh, mega RTAs. Let's say old fashioned RTAs were typically concluded between natural trading partners, uh, meaning uh, neighboring or historically in countries. However, uh, this has been changing rapidly with new approaches such as uh, RTAs among countries from different continents, as well as agreements uh, that involve parties accounting for uh, major shares of uh, world trade, so the mega trade agreements. Many South countries today are involved uh, either negotiating or because they are enforced in such agreements. And examples include, as you can see in the slide, the CPTPP, RCEP, Pacific Alliance, the African Continent Trade Area, among others. And I would like to spend a few words on the latter. So the decision to establish a continental free trade area was approved in January uh, 2012. And in 2018, the agreement to establish the African um, CFTA was signed. Uh, the agreement aims at creating a single market for goods and services to lay down the foundation for the establishment um, of a continental customs union at a later stage. And the agreement aims at liberalizing tariffs, uh, reducing non tariff barriers, including, of course, in agricultural trade. The agreement as such has enormous potential for the region and could be a key driver for improved food security and nutrition uh, of the continent. But of course, uh, RTAs are not only, let's say, fun and games, and they bring with them opportunities, but of course, also challenges. So RTAs can clearly lead to trade creation, since the reduction in trade barriers induced by the RTA um, facilitates or encourages uh, trade among the parties. However, it can also lead to trade diversion. And trade diversion occurs when the reduction or the elimination of the tariffs among the RTA parties powers uh, less efficient producers, so with possible impact as well on the sustainability of trade, uh, shipping imports from low-cost countries to higher-cost RTA exporters. RTAs can also have an impact on uh, preference erosion, which occurs when uh, the lower tariffs between RTA parties results in non-participating developing countries losing the competitive advantage they had through previous preferential market access schemes. And this can be an instance for um, business for poor disease. Uh, because for example, many developed countries, countries offer uh, preferential market access to, to LDCs. But when these developed countries participate in RTAs and open their markets to other known LDCs, uh, this preferential margin is reduced. And therefore we say that the LDCs preferences are eroded which leads us to an additional issue, namely the marginalization of weaker and more um, vulnerable developing countries. This could be of a particular concern for the developing countries whose exports are concentrated in a narrow range of products and at this time for a small number of trading partners. So what issue was referring to before? And another issue is related to the, uh, I would say, the trade architecture of, uh, of RTAs. And here we speak about the so-called spaghetti ball, 
Uh, what is the spaghetti ball? The spaghetti ball is uh, that phenomenon that occurs uh, when um, various rules, tariffs, uh, institutional arrangements apply at the same time. And this can create a complex regulatory structure that generates problems for both the exporters and importers and affect in turn the trade flows. Think, for instance, uh, of the possible problems in the application of the rules of origins. Now, in many RTAs, the different rules, um, the, the, the rules are different depending on the product in question. No? So whether the goods are fully obtained in a country or whether there was a substantial transformation of, of the good. Well, each RTA can therefore imply uh, separate certification processes to demonstrate compliance with such rules. And this creates uh, additional regulatory complexity, reducing in turn, let's say, the benefits from the preferential treatment that is normally accorded to the RTA. And now a few words to, to conclude. Um, so throughout this study, um, we understood, let's say, a few things. Um, first of all, that um, increased South-South trade contributes to the diversification of uh, the departments and reduces countries' exposures and vulnerability to exo exogenous shocks. As a consequence, uh, on the export side, it would be important to take advantage of uh, growing market opportunities and promote South countries' market access. While on the import side, and in particular in uh, net food importing countries, um, trade facilitation practices should be implemented to reduce the regulatory barriers and improve uh, trade efficiency. At the same time, to let's say mitigate the risks associated with uh, trade openness, uh, targeted social protection, labor market, and other um, upskilling measures should also be taken into, into account. We also saw that many exporting countries tend to concentrate exports uh, in very few products, and that many import dependent countries are facing challenges in increasing um, production because of little uh, productivity growth. So with regard to the exporting countries, it would be important to promote uh, product diversification and address uh, all those uh, supply side constraints that may impede the export of other competitive products, uh, including last mile technology, uh, infrastructures or, um, or digital technologies. And this is an issue that, of course, touches also upon importing countries uh, where additional measures will also be taken to promote uh, uh, sustainable production and productivity growth and to conclude a consideration on the WTO and the RTAs. Uh, so the entry to force of the agreement on agriculture has clearly led to a net decline in import tariff and has contributed to trade growth. Likely, um, RTAs have uh, further contributed to expansion of trade in South countries. In this context, still we believe that South countries should continue to engage in WTO negotiation as the um, integration of uh, the system has become has been key really key for them to steer economic growth and with this i would like to conclude thank you very much for your attention and, uh, and looking forward to the discussion thank you very much indeed uh, cosimo for this very interesting presentation and for the indeed uh, the findings and the pol possibly the policy priorities and action recommendations that are coming out of it. I think it's it's really at the heart of what we do, document the evidence that we make some policy recommendations for, for consideration. Uh, let me, uh, before opening the floor actually, uh, to question and answers, and I see already some coming in the in the in the chat box, but I would like also to ask you to uh, to refer to, to uh, use the, the Q&A module uh, to post your question. Uh, I would like, before we go into that, uh, we are very happy uh, to have Ambassador Cancela with us. Ambassador Cancela is the permanent representative of Uruguay to uh, the WTO, and uh, he will share his views on how uh, South Strait is seen from a government perspective. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, very pleased to see you again, and you have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Uh, let me start by thanking you for inviting me to participate as a discussant in this series of FAO uh, trade talks. Um, and thank and congratulate the authors 
of the report for their excellent presentation. Um, as the report makes it clear, uh, South countries participation and importance in global agri-food markets and trade, both as exporters and importers, has been increasing in the last two decades. Agricultural productivity growth, fueled by the incorporation of technology and knowledge, uh, has led to expansions in the production of many southern countries. At the same time, global demography and economic trends, including population growth and urbanization, coupled with economic growth and increasing per capita incomes, have contributed to growing demand for diverse food products. A clear example of this, uh, as the report also shows, is the case of China, uh, a country that has experimented an important growth and whose consumption of agri-food products has evolved and increased substantially in the last decades. For instance, China's imports of agricultural products uh, have increased by 78% in constant US dollars from, from 2010 to 2018, while its domestic production has increased by 36% in the same period. China's accession to WTO in 2001 has served as a catalyst for its participation in international trade. China has been the main trading partner for many Latin American countries in recent years, including for Uruguay since 2013. Needless to say, there is no one single and undifferentiated South, as developing countries have different trade and production patterns. Uh, there are net food import developing countries, uh, such as North African and some South and East Asian countries um, on the one hand, and net exporters, such as most Latin American countries, including Uruguay, uh, and some European, Central Asian, and Sub-Saharan uh, countries, uh, on the other hand. Let me refer to the case of Uruguay. 2021 was a record year for Uruguayan export, which totaled over 11.5 billion US dollars in a context of high commodity prices. Food and feed products were among the main export uh, including beef, first place with 21%, soybeans, third place with 8%, and dairy products, fourth place with 6% of total exports. And our main destination markets were China, 28%, Brazil, 16%, European Union, 14%, Argentina and the United States with 5% each. Uh, there is a relatively high level of concentration, both in terms of main export products and markets. Uh, and this can be seen looking at specific examples. For instance, let's see the case of beef. In 2005, 73% of Uruguayan exports of beef were sent to the US and the European Union. But the relative shares of these trading partners fell dramatically as China's share increased. In 2021, only 22% of Uruguayan exports of beef went to the US and the EU, while 61% went to China. We see a similar trend for other products. For example, almost all of Uruguayan exports of soybeans go to developing countries, with China as our main destination and Egypt as our second market. For dairy products, our main export markets in the last few years have been Algeria and Brazil. Although China overtook Brazil in 2021 after almost tripling 2020 values. Uruguay has always underlined the importance of trade as a fundamental driver for global food security. No single economy can claim 
to full self-sufficiency. We all rely on international trade for key components of our diet and for access to inputs, machinery, and services that allow us to produce safe and affordable food. Trade is essential to bring food from areas with surplus to areas with deficit in production. It facilitates, it facilitates access to food during local production shocks and across different production seasons and acts to prevent domestic shortages while leading to a more efficient and sustainable allocation of factors of production. As a country with only 3.5 million people, but which produces safe and quality food for 30 million people and can produce up to for 50 million people, Uruguay is an important and reliable contributor to global food security. Together with other competitive producers and exporters of agri-food products in the Kearns Group, my country participated actively in the Uruguay Ram negotiations that led to the agreement on agriculture. This was a major and historical success. For the first time, agricultural trade was put under multilateral rules. And the same agriculture agreement acknowledged from the beginning the need to continue the reform process. As mandated in Article 20 and the preamble of the agreement, we still need to substantially reduce agriculture support and protection, correcting and preventing restrictions and distortions in world agricultural markets in order to have a fair and market-oriented agricultural trade system. For this to happen, all the big partners developed or developing should contribute to the reform process in a manner proportionate, of course, to their level of participation and respective capacities of this stored international trade. Multilateral negotiations, we have to admit, have failed to deliver on these objectives, particularly in the areas of domestic support and market access with the only major outcome being the historical elimination of export subsidies in Nairobi in 2015. Uruguay has been one of the main proponents in the area of market access. In the understanding that agricultural tariffs continue to be the highest on average, and that we continue to face tariff peaks, complex tariffs and tariff escalation, in addition to increasingly important non-tariff measures. We share the report's conclusion that it's important, very important, that Southern countries continue to engage in these negotiations and seek to achieve substantial improvements in market access for their products. Although we regret that this engagement has been missing in most cases. Besides the need to continue progress on this file, my country has also clearly indicated that there cannot be a rollback of Uruguay round commitments. In 2008, Uruguay was very concerned about the potential creation of a special safeguard mechanism because it would impact normal trade growth and affect in particular developing export countries like us in the context of increased South-South trade that we have been discussing. This situation is not different now, as many members continue to oppose the creation of further barriers to trade in an already protected sector in the absence of new trade liberalization commitments. In recent years, Uruguay has been strongly pushing for capping and reducing trade and production distorting domestic support, including market price support, in order to allow for a fair competition. In this context, we have been very clear that 
any permanent solution to the issue of public stockholding for food security purposes should be seen in the context of broader domestic support reform. And it cannot be a blank check to provide market price support with highly destructive effects. A permanent solution should also have sufficient transparency requirements that allow to monitor effectively members' commitments and uh, adequate safeguards and anti-circumvention clauses that ensure that the stocks are, do not distort international markets and nor affect the food security of others and are used solely for domestic food security objectives. Uruguay interest on this matter can be better understood if we have a look at the evolution of international rice markets. While it was the fifth largest exporter with 8% of global exports in 2010, in 2020, India was by far the main exporter with 32% share of world exports of rice which include basmati and non-basmati. India has invoked twice the interim solution on PSH agreed in Bali 2013, after having exceeded its de minimis support level for rice in 2018, 2019, and 2019-2020. And many questions have been raised at the, w at the WTO Committee on Agriculture regarding its compliance with the Bali decision. And this is an issue that Uruguay has been following with interest, with interest given that around 90% of the rice we produce is exported, which makes rice one of our main export products with exports of 400 to uh, 500 million US dollars per year. This also makes us one of the top 10 global rice exporters selling rice to over 60 countries, including not only Latin American and European countries, but also destinations such as Iraq, Turkey, Sierra Leone, and Senegal, among others. In a context of stalemate in multilateral agriculture negotiations, many countries have resorted to a second best, the negotiation of RTAs, while this has allowed for a certain liberalization of agri-food trade, this has been only partial, thereby leading at times to trade diversion as it was shown in the report itself. And also to, as the spaghetti bowl phenomenon, again, we have clearly seen this in the report, in which regulatory and institutional arrangements governing different RTAs apply at the same time which sometimes produce complexities for international trade. For example, when it comes to rules of origin. Many Latin American countries have participated in this trend while um, with Chile, Peru, and Mexico as some of the most active in negotiations of RTAs and Mercosur countries lying a bit behind. Uruguay believes there is work to do on this regard in different configurations as participations in RTAs can complement multilateral negotiations. Although we have to keep in mind very clearly that they shouldn't replace them. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador for presenting your views and illustrating that with the, the, the example of your own country, uh, Uruguay. I think this is, this is very clear. And for, of course, linking to the to the findings and uh, and recommendation of the of the report, where I see a lot of uh, of coincidence uh, between the of concurrence between the two. So thank you so much, and uh, again, highly appreciated your present your participation. Uh, we now move to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Rashid Kokab from the uh, Geneva-based NGO Cuts. Uh, would like to share with us some uh, remarks on this interesting topic. And I don't see Mr. Kokar on the screen. Uh, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Can okay, you hear me? So, 
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Good thing. Thank you, Mr. Kokan. So the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Dominic. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I have had the honor of, of working with several FEO colleagues for almost 25 years now, and I'm very pleased to see that a couple of my old friends, uh, Jamie Morrison and Katia, are also among the participants. So thank you. Uh, thank you also for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, I Let me, before I say a few things, uh, let me make two <laughs> two important uh, uh, caveats. Uh, I am executive director of Kurtz International Geneva, which is an international Southern NGO with its offices in India, in Kenya, in, in Ghana, in uh, Zambia, and in Vietnam and Washington DC, but I am speaking in my personal capacity. Uh, also, since, uh, since this is being recorded, uh, and I just want to, to assure that in in terms of the little time I have, uh, perhaps uh, things, some of them at least may not be as clearly uh, comes out as was done by the other presenter. So I would be happy to, to clarify them uh, in the subsequent question answer session and would not like to be misunderstood. I hope. Thank you very much for bearing with that. Uh, the study is quite good. I had the chance of reading a draft version that was shared with me quickly. I think it has uh, uh, not just not just good research, but several points for deeper reflections, and 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 for discussion and for taking appropriate actions. So congratulations to the to the authors there, and I think that uh, I know that the study must have been initiated much before the current crisis that we are facing, but I think it is quite relevant from that point of view also of this the, this the present context what I would call due to very heightened concerns about food security and these disruptions in agriculture and food trade. What this, the current crisis tell us, it tell us many things, but let me pick up two uh, where the trade becomes really important. The need for diversified sources and destination for both any imports and exports. And this point comes out quite clearly, even without referring to the current situation. I would also argue that uh, the current crisis also tell us to do that, uh, uh, the diversified sources and uh, destination. There is an important need to fill in what would I would call the gaps in the soft and hard trade infrastructure. Trade, of course, requires production and exchange, but it does not take place in a vacuum. For it to flow between countries and among countries, both the hard infrastructure, the, the ports, the road connections, the rail connections, and all that, as well as what I call the soft infrastructure, knowing the other market, uh, knowing the rules there, uh, the banking relationships, the marketing relationships. So these are equally important. Actually, in our work in Africa, where we have worked a lot, uh, till some years ago, it was not a very unusual scene to see a country finding it more convenient, cheaper to trade with a historical partner in Europe than the country next door. And one major reason was lack or in a very limited, this hard and soft infrastructure. So that needs to be filled in. Uh, and I will, I will come to that point in a minute. And uh, that's uh, where, if I now can turn to some of the points in the, in the study, which I, I acknowledge is very good, very broad, uh, I just for illustration purposes and maybe to make some of uh, my subsequent points, talking about the South-South trade, three, what I would call the indications, which I think we must reflect long and hard, that while the South has been increasing both imports and exports, but as Ishrat also mentioned, since about 2008, 2010, we see that exports have increased less than the imports. So the, this, this net trade balance has widened. And of course, there, are, there could be good reason. On the demand side, as she mentioned, population and as well as purchasing power with the growing prosperity in parts of the South, that, that is increasing the demand. And I would imagine that trend of increasing demand will continue. Both the population is going to keep increasing in many parts of the South, and one can hope that, uh, that perhaps the purchasing power and the growth also. But on the other hand, the supply side, as he said, I would call it 
the, the growth in production and productivity has not matched that, that demand. So that is clearly a troublesome area that has the production and productivity growth in the countries of doubt in agriculture taken place and what does not see it happening all over. And we need to reflect on the reasons for that. In terms of the composition, again, to point to reflect that, we see that the major exports of, of southern, southern countries are what I would call the fresh products, many of them tropical products, uh, uh, coffee, cocoa, sugar, and what we call in the developing world, the cash crops. And many of these, of course, go to the north uh, or more affluent areas because I would call them, these are consumer demand. Uh, uh, where, where the purchasing power is high. On the other hand, we look at the imports and that is heavily concentrated what, uh, what is, can be called the food commodity, cereals, meat, dairy. And that's where I call it consumer dependence because these are often part, like cereals are pa often part of the basic food. And there again, can we think of, of one of the other things which can be relevant in this, in this interesting complex picture? Some of these products, dairy, meat, uh, and cereals, have been kind of sacred cows in some of the OCD countries in terms of absorbing quite a bit of domestic uh, support. So, point for reflection there as well. Then, of course, finally, the third indication, you know, in terms of the regions, yes, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean being generally export or more exports, and then Arab countries and South Asia and uh, and. East Asian Pacific since more recently more import. So again, one can think, okay, and there is there is a possibility to mix and match there. Now from there, uh, my own reflections moving towards, although I have not set the stage for making detailed recommendations, but I will still go ahead and perhaps offer some, some suggestions. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, that I think all a lot what but Ishrat and Kasimo and Ambassador uh, just mentioned would be relevant for that, though not all the points. I would say that, yes, we need to strengthen the South-South trade and that becomes even more imperative in the current crisis, but that is not just for the sake of it. So it's not like, okay, we should replace trading with North and for ideological reasons is to start trading with South. I think the overall objective is to increase this trade to strengthen, to promote, to ensure food security all over the world and particularly Southern countries because they get hit harder. And then of course, for their development. So keeping that larger objective in mind, strengthening South-South trade makes a lot of sense. And that can be done uh, through several ways and many, many other points have been raised. So let me pick a few, a few of them. One, I would say filling in these gaps that I had mentioned earlier is quite critical. The hard uh, uh, and soft infrastructure of establishing trading relationships among the countries of South, this is still in some cases advanced, but in many other cases, we go across the developing world and we see this not really being the full case. So attention focus to that because that would also add to this, the objective of diversifying sources and destination, uh, which can be quite uh, a good outcome for the countries of the South and I would argue for the world itself. Then when, uh, remember the earlier point, this growing gap, and then of course, which cleared between exports and imports, so clearly shows the need for increasing production and productivity. And that's where the investments at the national and regional level in increasing that agricultural production and productivity uh, through, through various means is really important. The third, I would uh, briefly mention, yes, about RTAs. The RTAs can be a good vehicle to build that infrastructure and filling the gaps that I was talking about, to motivating, uh, promoting, strengthening, supplementing the investment that I talked about. And that's where I don't think that the need is to sign negotiate even more RTAs, not necessarily. It's more like, okay, can one look at them, 
with a view to deepening and broadening, particularly when it comes to agricultural trade and the needed policy instruments there. And this is where I think uh, more definitely can be done and should be done. And finally, uh, I know that no, no talk on uh, agricultural trade uh, would be complete without talking about the WTO and the multilateral trading system. Because yes, it is very clear that any comprehensive approach towards agricultural trade have to have actions at the WTO. Because one, one glaring example, countries would not reform the domestic subsidies except in the multilateral setting. So that's why coming back to the reform agenda in the WTO, these long old negotiations. I started my Geneva career in 95 as a Pakistani diplomat to the WTO, including dealing with agriculture and a agriculture was called a word, don't utter it. And I'm just surprised that despite the passage of more than 25 years, we have not made much progress, hardly any progress, ap apart from the, the, the historical decision on export competition. So taking that agenda forward in the WTO is critical. And I would say that that's where probably I would put more emphasis on the domestic support reform. That is clearly an unfinished business of 30, 40 years old. That has this impact when we look at various products and crops, uh, particularly uh, some, some dealing with food security, a very high level of subsidization, often by the countries of the, of the North, does depress the or can depress the global prices, which can have an impact on the investment decisions, increasing the production in the South, which can lead to more trade at, at more uh, 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 production. So definitely that agenda needs to be taken forward. Let me also mention there one thing, which is not part of the directly in the Doha, the agriculture negotiations, but I think the current situation does warrant an attention on that. And that is the issue of net food importing developing countries, which are dependent on food imports and, and what to do with them. Uh, because in the current crisis, that is, again, they are bearing the brunt of that. And then of course, that's where definitely more South-South trade, more help to those countries, as well as adequate WTO actions will be really, really urgently needed. So let me stop here with thanks again. And, uh, uh, and as I said, uh, perhaps some of the points of our making may not have been very clear. So I'll be happy to, to explain more if needed and answer uh, questions. But thank you, Dominique, back to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rashid. Uh, I think to me it was very clear, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much for your reflection and for your your points also on the diversification of sources and destination and, uh, and for making reference to this uh, hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure, and, and making a relation also to the role of the, the RTAs as a, uh, perhaps we, you, you said we don't need more of them, but we need to deepen and broaden and to, uh, that they can be a good vehicle to fill the gap. I think these, these are, uh, some of the many uh, very interesting recommendations which you you made. So thank you again for this. And uh, now uh, I will I will go to the to the next part of our session, which is uh, the the Q and A. Uh, we have received some questions, and uh, and there were some so, or there were already some in the in the Q and A uh, in the chat uh, box. So I will I will go straight to uh, Ishrat uh, most probably with uh, questions that we have received from uh, from uh, Tamas Vatai, uh, who was who is referring to the, the current situation, which is indeed uh, highlighting the, the vulnerability of net food importers, uh, developing countries to crop supplies from other regions. Uh, how uh, could uh, South-South trade and trade within region address these uh, vulnerabilities? This is the first question. And then the second one, still from Thomas Vatai, uh, is uh, reads as follow, low income countries share in global agri-food export is very low, around 1%, and they export mainly unprocessed agricultural commodities. All their production capacities and trade could be enhanced through South-South cooperation. So Ishrat, 
the floor is yours and you may want also to 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 engage with your your to engage your, your colleague Cosimo. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I, I can start and then Cosmo, please, uh, please do add um, after my intervention. Um, both excellent questions. Um, I think on the first point, indeed, the current situation does highlight vulnerabilities. This is sort of a case in point about vulnerabilities and managing those uh, vulnerabilities to shocks. Um, one thing I would say is that uh, particularly given this situation, um, in light of you know the report and what we see in terms of aggregate trends, I actually see a bit of a positive story here, which is that, um, in fact, partner dependency, as I was mentioning, has actually gone down in, in both exports and imports. So even in those, uh, even in, in, in countries, uh, in, in all regions, in most regions, in fact, we see that the dependency on specific or a small number of trading partners has declined uh, in imports. So countries today are in a better position to deal with vulnerabilities than they were 20 years ago as a result of having... Um, uh, as, as a result of many factors. And we saw that um, increasing levels of South-South trade, uh, we see increasing levels of South-South imports. So what that says is that, and in fact, one thing that I didn't uh, show in the presentation that is in the report is that if you look at just to a simple correlation of countries that increase their, um, th th that, are, that import more, they tend to have lower levels of partner dependency. This is just a correlation, it's not a causation, but it shows that as countries integrate more into, uh, into global trade, they diversify also the sources of their trading partners and that in itself reduces vulnerability. So this is sort of the long-term view and this can be of course expedited. I agree with a lot of the points that, uh, that Rashid was making about um, how do you actually deepen um, trade uh, within and among South, uh, South country regions. Uh, so deepening RTAs, um, uh, uh, leading to regulatory um, simplicity, so the things that Cosmo was talking about, the spaghetti bowl phenomenon, kind of reducing the, the regulatory complexity that comes with that. These are all things, um, trade facilitation, these are all things, these are long-term things that countries can invest in now to enable them to be better prepared for, for dealing with shocks. But I'd also like to point out a short term, you know, when you're in the middle of a crisis or in a situation like this, and we saw this with COVID as well, what is the short term response that needs to happen? And one thing almost counterintuitively we need to keep in mind is that as, um, as countries feel more vulnerable to shocks in international markets, particularly as food prices start to rise, there's a tendency to start imposing export restrictions. And that in itself can create a whole, whole host of other problems. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind for the, for the you know, the, the, the broader uh, global trading system and agricultural trade in particular is to ensure, as we did with, with the COVID um, situation, to keep agricultural markets open, to keep trade flowing, um, to ensure that to, to avoid these sort of ad hoc export restricting measures um, to, um, that can actually exacerbate the problem more than, um, more than uh, what, it, what it really is. Um, going to the second question about uh, low-income countries uh, being a very small share of agricultural exports, it's very, uh, that, that, that's absolutely right. Um, in fact, LDCs in particular tend to be, they have been net importers. Um, in, in our study, we found that they've been net agricultural importers for the entire period that we studied. And dealing with that really has two sides of it. One, um, and I think Rashid already captured a lot of that in his comments, on the one side is dealing with the infrastructure gaps, the sort of the core su uh, supply side constraints. Uh, we know, for instance, countries, I'm just taking Africa as an example because I presented that, it also has many of the LDCs. Um, uh, they, they have poor infrastructure, um, poor infrastructure gaps, both hard and soft infrastructure, as, as Rashid was mentioning. Um, lack of access to inputs, to finance, um, and also, again, regulatory, uh, regulatory complexity. So all of these things sort of add to the supply side constraints. But at the same time, you have, uh, in some ways, uh, there's a role for policy as well. So you need conducive policies, you need aligned agriculture and trade policies to try to, uh, to boost, to make sure that there's a sort of a coherent incentive that's being provided uh, to agricultural producers in these countries. You need uh, investments, R&D investments, extension investments to actually uh, reach the, the, the farmers that, that actually um, face the, the, the biggest producti uh, productivity gaps. So these are some of the ways in which um, uh, some of the ways in which um, LDCs can be supported to, to first of all boost their own production uh, and diversify their production, meeting their own demands, but eventually also um, hopefully um, supplying uh, export markets as well. Thank you. And pass to Cosimo in case you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, 
uh, Ishrat, and also highlighting, of course, the point of uh, market transparency and the role tools like AMIS, the Agricultural Market Information System, uh, can play in this regard. This was established after the food price crisis, uh, L'Aquila, G20, and since then it has proven a very, very uh, useful tool. Uh, going to Cosimo, and Cosimo, in your response also, I would like also to ask you if you could also address an, another question uh, that has come up, and, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, when you, you, you were discussing the, the opportunities and challenges in regional trade agreements, you mentioned preference erosion, marginalization of vulnerable country, and trade distortion. As we see that RTAs are more and more covering regulatory aspects, do you see a challenge in this regard? I think this would be a point uh, of interest, uh, most probably to, to our audience today. Over to you, uh, Cosimo. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dominic. Uh, David, I can only confirm uh, what, uh, what Ishrat and um, you said so far. Absolutely. It's extremely important now to keep uh, um, international trade uh, um, open and uh, to, to avoid as well export restrictions, because uh, yes, absolutely. They can exacerbate price volatility. They can create a lot of problems. And uh, <clears throat> yes, as Isha correctly said, I see some clear similarities with what happened with the, with the COVID crisis. And I would say that one of the reasons why uh, international trade made it, let's say, through the COVID crisis was that uh, countries took every step to keep trade open. And uh, this was absolutely fundamental. Um, coming to your other question, so on... Um, <clears throat> on the problems uh, on, on trade agreements, of course. Uh, the regulatory aspects are clearly another uh, issue of concern in RTAs. Uh, just think about all the different uh, non-tariff measures that can apply in this or in that country. Um, so nowadays as well, one of the most difficult aspects uh, of uh, trade negotiations is not anymore the tariff regime, or not only, uh, but indeed the SPS, for instance, or the TPP, uh, the TPP chapters. And on the specific problems, uh, first of all, like harmonization toward more rigorous regulatory standards usually brings uh, difficulties, costs. And this can be a problem for, um, for many, mainly for um, smallholder farmers. Plus, uh, we may end up, uh, like for the rules of origins we mentioned before, uh, in a context in which uh, exporters have to cope with uh, complex, multiple, and um, overlapping rules. And this is why it is important for countries to to follow what are the, let's say, the international standards. And um, in this regard, the only thing I can do is to underline uh, the role played by, for instance, the international uh, standard setting organizations, the so-called, um, the three sisters, um, Codex, uh, the um, Organization for Animal Health, uh, ITTC. And to conclude, as uh, Ishal was mentioning before, recall the importance of uh, the trade facilitation agreement, uh, for instance, in cutting uh, red tape. Uh, for instance, when it comes uh, to, to procedures for import and exports, and very important as well, the measures for um, like effective cooperation between uh, customs and other, um, and other authorities. That will be, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cosimo. And again, thank you also, uh, Ishrat. Uh, uh, I would like to clarify that the report is available. It's online. Uh, so uh, I, I, we will make sure that the, the link for sure is shared and is uh, also attached to the to the um, I mean um, to the proceedings of this meeting and the and the, and the recordings of this meeting. So we'll make sure you have it. So now before closing this this webinar, because unfortunately time is flying, I would like to to give the opportunity to Mr. Fatih Adri from the FAO South South and Triangular Corporation. Uh, division uh, to make some uh, some observations. Uh, Fati, great to see you, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, distinguished uh, participants, FAO colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by uh, thanking you all for participating in this insightful discussion on agricultural trade in the Global South. On behalf of uh, our director of the South-South and Triangular Cooperation, Mr. Yi Anping, I would like to thank our FAO colleagues from the Trade and Markets Division for undertaking 
this informative study with in-depth analysis of agricultural trade of southern countries, including nature of trade in agricultural products, main obstacles and barriers, trade opportunities, implications of trade liberalization, and some recommendations. You know, COVID-19 has put the global trade, and in particular agricultural trade, at the heart of the discussions on food security and livelihoods. One of the several findings from the study is that uh, despite the tremendous growth in South uh, countries' exports, as well as growth in South-South trade as a group, the Global South continue to be net exporters of many primary agricultural products and net importers of food commodities. The inclusion of South uh, Global South in food value chains has been acknowledged to have multiplier effects on uh, employment and the uh, poverty reduction. High dependency on specific commodities and trading partners makes countries increasingly vulnerable to market and policy related shocks. It is then essential uh, and therefore that the global south continues to diversify the portfolio of products traded as well as trading partners. FAO has also a long history in supporting and prom promoting South-South and triangular cooperation amongst its member states in the areas of agriculture and food systems. Since 1996, FAO has raised over 435 million US dollars for SSTC. This has allowed the deployment of more than 2,000 experts and technicians to 80 countries, transferring knowledge, technologies, and innovations to millions of smallholder farmers. SSTC can play a valuable role in fostering its exchange of innovation and good practices on sanitary and phytosanitary measures and technical barriers to trade among the global south and expanding market opportunities across countries with similar priorities and shared development objectives. We look forward for further collaboration in the field of south-south trade, including possible avenues in capacity building of Southern member countries and regional economic integration organizations in the area of trade, including trade tools for analysis and methodological support, trade opportunities, trade policy, organization of markets, agriculture-based multilateral negotiations, and implication also of trade increase on agri-food systems. Let me conclude by highlighting that South-South trade is not a substitute for North-South trade. It is a complement and a bridge between traditional and emerging partners. It offers a model of cooperation and collaboration that leverages synergies stemming from North-South and South-South South -South cooperation initiatives. Before concluding, I would like to thank FAO Liaison Office in Geneva for hosting this extremely valuable discussion. And thank you very much. Over to you, Dominique. Thank you very much, uh, Fatih, uh, for, your, for your remarks, for uh, indeed highlighting FAO achievements when it comes to uh, South-South and Triangular cooperation in general, uh, how it supports uh, South-South trade 
and uh, and the potential because there is a huge potential in south south and uh, in triangular cooperation to indeed uh, support more and better quality uh, uh, south south uh, trade which you describe as a bridge so this is very uh, very important thank you uh, so much indeed for that uh, it is now 4 27 so we have reached the end of the of our event today and i would like to really uh, thank uh, the our presenters our discussants for all their their contributions uh, this is of course highly appreciated this is what makes the quality of our of our trade talks this is uh, we we really appreciate your participation and as i mentioned earlier we will be continuing this series of dialogue on a on a monthly basis hopefully and the next event will be taking place on the 26th uh, april we'll send out uh, invitation uh, closer to the date and we hope to see you back uh, for that occasion again i wish to thank you all for your participation and wish you a good uh, a good rest of the day uh, we are almost at the end in geneva but there are other locations participating and we hope to to have you in our dialogues in the future thank you so much and bye bye thank you bye thank you bye. thank you bye